The No Nonsense Roundtable. It's a weekly show broadcast on Rochester, New York's 50,000 watt iHeart radio station, News Radio Wham 1180. The host, Dom Geneva, interviews guests from all walks of life, all with amazing stories to tell. What you are about to hear is a recording of a previous broadcast without the breaks and commercials. Now, here's host Dom Geneva. Well, welcome everybody to another edition of the No Nonsense Roundtable. I'm Dom Geneva, your host, as you know. And uh, like I like to remind you, uh, 10 o'clock Saturdays on News Radio M 1180, but all the old shows or prior shows, maybe is a better way to word it, is on No Nonsense Roundtable.com. And we have had 266 shows so far. When I started this show on uh, January, I think it was 26th, uh, 2019, and my first guest was Mr. Bob Duffy, and he is here once again, and this is your sixth appearance, Bob. Dom, it's great to be here. I remember that first show very well, and it's an honor to be invited back. Well, I want to. I want to. I, I want to read a quote from you. Uh, uh, Dom Geneva brings Rochester's past, present, and future to life each week on his show through entertaining interviews with his guests. You may know some guests, you may never have heard of others, but you will walk away having learned so much about Rochester and the many great people who permeate our community. Thanks to Dom, I tune in every opportunity. I have never been disappointed. Thank you. <laughs> that is that's that. What what an endorsement that is. Well, it came from the heart, and I want to go on record. I write that myself, so I don't have a ghostwriter or anybody writing for me. Uh, I like to communicate myself personally, and uh, it was a really it's a privilege to be on this show. And oh. whenever I tune in, I learn a lot about whoever's on. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, I think that some people get the show and some people don't get the show you know it's, it's like a box of chocolates you know and the other thing is i'm not i'm not on one side or the other side you, you know if, if you make sense i'm gonna be on your side but i'm not I, you know i don't have this thing where you know like like you know you have to be identified with a certain group or not it, it seems like you're 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 the same way too I mean, i'm exactly the same way i'll go on record I hate the far left and the far right. Uh, I think most people, if you look at a football field, are between the 40-yard lines. In the middle, a little right, a little left. Uh, but that, to me, is the majority of our community and our country. They're, they're not you know, embedded in these far extremes, left and right. Uh, and I just believe in uh, you know, the people, the spirit of people we have here in this community and talk to people all the time and, and get that. And sometimes those voices, which represent a very small number of people, drown out the majority. Uh, and I do think we have to speak up a little more and people have to you know, be a lot more vocal about what is important to them, what is not important to them, and make sure those in elected office hear that. Well, you know, the, the other thing is, unfortunately, I think it's going to get worse with all this AI stuff. You know, you're not, not going to know if that person is actually speaking or not, or that's the person you're looking at. Is that person or not? I mean, this is <laughs> this is scary. It, it is scary. And, and uh, was that announcement today, the governor was in town uh, about a huge investment in New York State in AI. And it is like, like anything, like the Internet. Uh, when things come out and start, I, I do think uh, it can scare people. Uh, but I do think there has to be some controls, but also some common sense applied as well. And, and, and you know, technology should be a servant, not a master. And I think we have to use it to our best of, of our abilities, but also just be careful of the downside of that. And there's a, there's a downside to almost every technology. And hopefully AI will be helpful, uh, but not necessarily uh, a, a negative impact. And, and New York State, with all its higher education, brain power, and what we have in, in the state, should be a leader nationally in developing what is the future of AI. Well, I'm looking at, um, right off the top of my head, your, your resume. Uh, you were a police officer, police chief, mayor, uh, lieutenant governor. Now you're uh, CEO and president of the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce. Why aren't you running for president? <laughs> can't hold the job. I, I would like to can't hold the job. <laughs> can't hold the job. No, no. I mean, that's. I mean, that's. Uh, you know, that, that's the elephant in the room. Is that we have we have these two choices, and, and, and out of 300 million people, these are the best guys we can come up with. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what, I, uh, I had 10 years in elected office. Uh, I am not a career politician. Uh, I love all my careers, uh, and I love the one I'm in right now. Uh, but I do think a lot of really good people do not want to go into politics because they may have done something wrong in the third grade, and it'll be on the front page of, of every newspaper across the country. There is such uh, an effort to discredit and attack anybody 
going in, local, state, federal level, uh, that some just decide to stay out of it. And especially with some of the, the unhinged characters we see from time to time, uh, they might feel that they're going uh, to impact the safety of themselves and their family. But we have to get good people back in elected office. And no one wants to hear this. I, I, term limits. I, I just think that anyone going into office uh, should go with the, uh, the thought, I'm going to be in for one term, be it a two or four year term, not go in for a long term career to get reelected over and over and over again. If you go in and you are bold and you are going to serve the people that put you in office and you don't care about offending those that disagree with you, you do what you think is right. I essentially, you'll be in office as long as you care to be in office, but far too often people go in and they want to go along with whatever the loudest advocates uh, say they should do or polling states. And often they make decisions based on staying in office uh, with this longevity, which I I go back to the other part. And when people say, well, term limits don't work because, um, you know, uh, people who vote, uh, they have the term limits in their hands. I would say uh, out of every election that I've seen, if you get to a 50% turnout, it's huge. Locally in Rochester, if you get to 30%, it's huge. So I figured 30% turnout rate out of every 10 people, seven do not vote. And I'll also add one more proviso, and I tell people this, if you don't vote, don't complain. Votes matter. Well, who is it? It was one of our founding fathers says that uh, uh, democracy is only going to work in a an informed electorate. And, and, when you don't, and, and, and that's exactly what you're talking about. You get all this stuff on the fringes. And people kind of seek out the news that kind of, you know, I, I was listening to um, Tucker Carlson the other day and he had, and like I said, I'm not a Republican, I'm not, not, a, that, not a Democrat. I didn't want to deride Fox News or whatever, but he was saying, well, you know, in, in, uh, in Russia, you know, a hundred dollars worth of food is, is, you know, it gets you enough for the whole, you know, whatever it is. And he says, that, wouldn't that be great if we had that in the United States? Well, but but they only make $200 a week. Yeah, yeah I mean, It's completely out of context. You left the context out that would make that make sense. Okay. And, and that's what you're seeing in, in so much of the stuff we see on TV and the radio. People don't read. Uh, they might uh, catch a headline. They might catch maybe the first two paragraphs of an yeah. article. Uh, they'll, on social media, they're back and forth. And uh, I mean, how many people on social media, uh, speak for X or Twitter, actually use their own names? Uh, I would say a very small percentage <laughs> because they're either bots, they're anonymous. They, they don't want to use their name because they're afraid to say something. And I believe this. If you can't say something to someone's face and have your name behind it, don't say it. Well, we're almost ready to head into a break. We got about another uh, minute and a half here, you know, but you know, Rochester's like, depending on what you look at on TV or the radio, you know, it's like the tale of two cities. I never read the tale of two cities, but the tale of two cities, I mean, it's, it's either the, the, the best place in the world to live, or it's the worst wor- place in the world to live, depending on what you listen to. So um, we're, we're going to talk about math and logic when we get to this, but there was a great report this, uh, this morning that came out that said that uh, U.S. News and World Report uh, report that uh, Rochester, I think, is in the number eight, you know, out of all these cities. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. There's a lot of challenges that we have, too. And uh, as, as you have this varied and wonderful experience across the spectrum, we're going to be talking about some of this stuff. You know, obviously there's the elephant in the room, which is uh, what's happening with uh, crime in Rochester. There are opportunities that you have. There's opportunities with, with like Lifecycle. I want to find out what you know about that because I am totally in the dark what's happening over there. And, uh, and, and Bob, whatever else you want to talk about. Good. Uh, the uh, actually the poll we mentioned, I, I've seen those in the past. I, I think Rochester is a good place. Someone once described Rochester as uh, a bad cover, but a great book. Uh, it was interesting. <laughs> and other others. Well, I thought it was, it was I, great. I'm a marketing guy. I love that. That's exactly it. Yeah. It was a, a former board member of mine. And, and I thought it was like bingo. And last very quick thing, a former Codex CEO, Dan Carp, once told me when I was mayor uh, that Rochester was the hardest place to get Codex executives to come to when they were in their heyday recruiting and a hardest place to get them to leave once they were here. I thought that really defines Rochester. Well, yeah, well, yeah I'm a marketing guy. So, so in, in other words, you have a marketing problem. There's not a problem with the food. The, the yeah. restaurant's great. The food's good. It's yeah. safe. It's tasty. But nobody nobody wants to go to the place because it's named something, you know. It's, well, but then again, we do have garbage plates. So that's a anachronism, I guess. So, well, anyway, right after this, I will be talking more with Bob Duffy. This section of the No-Nonsense Roundtable is brought to you by, well, the No-Nonsense Roundtable. 
You see, at the No Nonsense Roundtable, we do marketing for different organizations. And let me give you an example. Here's an ad that we did for the Rotary Sunshine Camp just recently, and it was voiced by Don Alhart. It's a magical place for kids of all abilities. At no charge, the Rochester Rotary Sunshine Camp has been serving children of all abilities for the last hundred years. Help us grow into the next hundred years. Go to sunshinecamp.org to learn more about how you can help. Where kids have no barriers to fun. We do all sorts of things, mainly for smaller companies. So if you'd like to investigate the possibility of us doing some work for you, contact me at nonsenseroundtable.com. This segment of the No Nonsense Roundtable is brought to you by McClure, Chrysler Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Chevy, and Buick, and Perry. Hey, all new car dealers pay the same price for their new cars and trucks. There's no volume discount. So your buying decision now comes down to price and ease of doing business. Family owned for generations, you'll find John McClurk himself there in the dealerships day to day, and you get a great no-nonsense deal you'll be hard-pressed to find anywhere else. Contact them at McClurkChryslerDodgeJeep.com or simply go to NoNonsenseRoundtable.com to connect with them. Well, welcome back. You're listening to the No Nonsense Roundtable. We're here with, well, I think everybody likes this fella. Is it Bob Duffy? Do you have anybody that doesn't like you? You know, I'm... I'm sure there are plenty out there. <laughs> well, they keep it. They keep it quiet because you know there's, you know, there's some people that just carry themselves in a, in a way where you know this this fellow in office or this uh, oh he's a dirty so and so and you don't have, you you seem to have uh, uh, escaped all that. Well, actually, uh, I was raised by great parents. Uh, I like to think I treat everybody with respect um, at all times, and you know, I, like we were saying earlier, I'm one uh, that. A, uh, I don't believe in criticizing people publicly. I've had a number of public positions. I don't do that. I don't attack people publicly. If I disagree, I people never have to guess what I'm thinking if we're sitting there having a one-on-one conversation or a phone call. Uh, but to me, it's about showing respect to, to people. And I don't care what station you are in life. And, you know, I I used to be accused. I, I would spend as much time with somebody homeless on the street as I would with a CEO of a company. Mm-hmm. And I just think that I never forgot where I came from, my roots in the 10th ward of the city and uh, a super modest upbringing. Uh, never was born with a silver spoon ever, uh, nor was my wife. Uh, but I just, you know, be, been, been very blessed. And I look at so many of the issues I see today. We, you know, I talked earlier, a, a book by John Love and, uh, you know, what he went through mm-hmm. in, uh, in, in his life. I'd always say I hit the jackpot with my parents. Oh, yeah. uh, we didn't have very much money, but you know what? There was love morals, a compass, uh, and repercussions if you cross the line. So, you know, my mother could have run a U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, you know, when you were good, it was reinforced. It was good. But, you know, and I always tell a story. I broke a window at eight years old. And if you know the 10th Ward, I lived at the corner of Dove Street and Lakeview Park. Broke a window I, over on Bidwell Terrace, one street over. And ran home, and parents came down, and, you know, I certainly admitted to it. Well, my mother grounded me for 30 days. It's a true story. Week goes by. You know, I'm in my, I'm staying in my little box backyard. My friends are all playing football on the street and running around. I have to stay in a little yard, uh, probably my 10 by 10, like almost a cell with grass. Uh, and then the second week goes by and, you know, I'm thinking I want to get out and play. Third week starts. So I th- I'm thinking my mother forgot about this. So I went in one day, mom, uh, and I go out and play. She takes me by the hand in the pantry. There's a, a calendar. She says, nope, you have a week and six days to go. Uh, my mother, I, I always say, she never believed in probation. She believed in uh, you know true punishment. And I knew that if I broke a window again, it would be 60 days. <laughs> and and that was my mother. And you know what? Uh, if, if my mother would let me go early uh, without serving my full sentence at that time of, of being uh, grounded, I probably would have lost respect for her authority. But she reinforced it. And I do think one of the issues today is there is very little accountability for bad behaviors, be it stolen cars, other things, retail theft, you name it. Uh, I think the pendulum has swung so far. Uh, it, certainly there are injustices and things are wrong in our criminal justice system, 
but the entire system is not wrong or bad. Uh, so fix the problem. Don't blow the whole system up. And I think we're seeing the repercussions and the results today when there really is not accountability for one's behaviors. If someone feels they could steal three or four cars and get an appearance ticket and steal three or four more cars, right. and an appearance ticket goes on and on. Um, and I honestly think that at some point, uh, leadership around the country and everywhere else will say that, you know what, this experiment did not it, it work. Worked. Let's go back and apply common sense. Well, I, I've had two um, other people in law enforcement that made uh, comments about this. And, and one was uh, one was Todd, Todd Baxter. And Todd said, you know, it's sort of like, it, it's sort of like, I, I understand there's systemic problems that, you know, that in the past that maybe needed to be corrected or whatever. But he says, L let's take a look at this sort of like it's a, a, a fire prevention. You know, you have a, you have a school and you want it to be uh, totally fire free and you want it to be protected and have fire uh, resistant uh, uh, but he says you you, st you still need you, you still need a fire truck. You still need to stop the shooting. You still need to do something. I, I understand that the environment that people brought it uh, were brought up and were very challenging. But you have to also have them have uh, consequences of their own behavior. And the other one was uh, Grady Judd. I don't know if you know Grady or not, but he's a uh, famous guy on the internet. He has a uh, he is a he's the uh, sheriff of Polk County. Uh, Florida. And, uh, and he says, when you get people that do something and they don't have any consequences, it encourages other people that are like, oh, Joe could get away with that. You know, I can get away with that too. So it just builds on itself, right? It's true. I mean, there has to be parameters and rules. That to me, a civil society has that. And you look back at some of these huge issues uh, where people have uh, certainly uh, been, you know, maybe died in custody with the police, uh, police officer, what have you. I'll go back to one simple concept. Imagine if a police officer placed somebody under, under arrest and everybody uh, says, okay, well, my hand's up uh, and I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to run uh, because if my uh, penal law code still holds true, um, you can't even resist legally an unlawful arrest. Uh, when a police officer puts you under arrest, you're not supposed to resist arrest. Mm -hmm. But if the arrest is bad, then you know, have your lawyer go sue, whatever. You might make money off it, ever the case. But if people stopped resisting, running, uh, running with a gun in your hand, whatever it may be, uh, just stop, put their hands up, did not fight. Uh, you would see far less of these issues ever happening, number one. Uh, number two, hey, listen, I was a cop for 28 and a half years. Most police officers go to work. They don't want to get into a fight. They don't want to chase anybody. Oh, they yeah. want to go home at night. They don't want to, you know, because uh, believe me, I don't care how tough a police officer thinks, someone is 10 times tougher on the street. And I can tell you just from experience growing up here and seeing that throughout my life. But most cops want to go home. Uh, they don't want to get into a fight and wrestle and fight with people. But if... First of all, if we reinforce the kids, do not resist arrest. If you think you're you're being wronged, you know what? There's a process to take that and go back. And you know what? If a police officer or somebody is wrong, well, it'll be rectified in the, in the system. But running, fighting, uh, that, that to me leads to so many of these tragedies you hear about nationally. And the number one lesson I would teach kids and over and over again, do not do that. And I'll guarantee you, if that stopped tomorrow, you would see these incidents that really end up uh, making national news and whether a person died in custody or not, they would pretty much come to a complete stop. Mm -hmm. I, but do you think this, I mean, I, I cannot conceive of the political will for 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 any anybody in office to go backward on these things. I mean, that's going to take a hell of a a hell of a, a hell of a lift, and and that's what happens is that I think you know you have these unintended consequences, and nobody go wants nobody wants to go backward. Nobody wants to say no. We we need to tighten this up. Tightening it up is harder than doing something the other way to begin with, don't you think? Yep. I, you know, uh, the governor was in town today, and I I know she has tried uh, this actually in town this week. Uh, she has tried uh, to roll back some of the the issues, and there's been some changes in, in the state system. But I think here's the thing. The concept of bail reform, there's a concept I agree with. If two people are arrested uh, and one is affluent, one is poor, same crime, the kid with money or family money, he walks out, the other kid uh, sits in jail for six months awaiting trial, there, there's an issue there. Um, and it, it should not be a matter of affluence. But uh, if that affluent kid steals like five cars in a week, I don't care if his father's Warren Buffett, he should be back in jail. Right. Uh, he is a menace to people in, in our community and society. Uh, and he should be there awaiting uh, a trial and then have, have uh, the system, you know, make their adjudication. I think it comes down to not affluence. It comes down to behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not 
what you look like, who you are, how much money you have. It's what you actually do uh, that should be the issue. And judges have, you know, it's not just police officers or system or the law. Uh, there's a lot of issues with bail reform. They, uh, bail reform gets blamed, but judges have the ability to do much more than they do, and they're turning people loose. Really? You know, I, oh, I, absolutely. I, I've heard it blamed on the system, not the judges. I tell you what, there's there's fingers going every direction. Really? But not in every case. There are judges, and I've seen uh, people make specific examples where they could have kept somebody in. You know, I'll give you an example in New York City. Um, you know, you have uh, four or five people. I think they're migrants from South mm-hmm. America. Yeah beating up two police officers, uh, fleeing, uh, getting arrested, and there's no bail. And I go back to, aside from affluence, one, the number one uh, requirement for bail, as I remember it, uh, during my career, is that the person shows up for a trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, if somebody is not a citizen, if somebody does not live here, uh, what, what guarantee is that? And I think a different decision could have been made by the DA at that time. That's, that is absolutely uh, astounding. And uh, we're going to pick up on that right after this news break. This section of the show is sponsored by Fanatics Pub in Lima. It's real close, boys and girls. Just go down Route 390, 10 minutes south of Marketplace Mall to exit 10. Make a left, go past two lights, and you're right there. This coming week, Saturday, February 24th, they have the Taz Crew Band. Great food, great music, and the owner, Jim Shelley, is always there to greet you at the door. Go to fanaticspub.com for tickets, and I'll see you there. Well, we're back talking to uh, Bob Duffy, who is the um, president and CEO. I don't, you know, it's always president and CEO. Is there a CEO and a president sometimes? Or, you know, I, I don't know. It's always president and CEO. I inherited the title. I don't know. Uh, well, it used to be like just executive, Bob. You know, like executive director, <laughs> yep. you know, so they pay you less money, you know, because they give you a nicer title. title. Is that it? <laughs> it's, okay. it's probably part yeah, of it. Yeah, that's it. You, yeah. Okay. Um, we were talking about crime and uh, bail reform or whatever, and so, something that I had the perception of that maybe not true, is that uh, I heard it blamed on the system with the judges and the judges didn't have any discretion to hold anybody. And we were just talking about this incident in the... In uh, in New York City, where these uh, you know you, 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 you know they're illegal immigrants, okay? I mean, let, let's call you know let's call a horse a horse. So they're illegally they're here illegally, you know whether you say it's right or not. This is but they're here illegally, and they beat up a bunch of cops, and they got sent out on an appearance ticket, right? Yep, no bail at all, and and bail is a guarantee for coming to trial. And, and going back to my point, you know, earlier in the segment, um, I think the law does create a situation where some people can't be, uh, you know, held, but there's also discretion at judges. And I've heard both sides where mm. a little bit of both. And I think there, there has to be an examination right down to what a person can and can't do. I'm assuming that when you assault a uniformed police officer, um, and as it happened in New York city, I am shocked that there could not, it's not a bailable offense, number one. Number two, if a person does not reside there, has no residence, uh, you know, what guarantee he or she will come back at trial? As we've known, I think four or five people have fled. Um, Or I'll I'll go back to Rochester. I mean, there's, there's data. If, say, a person lives in poverty, there's very little chance that person will move more than four or five blocks. Uh, they're not yeah. going to, you know, they're not going to, uh, they won't leave here and head down to, you know, out to LA or Denver. They might head you know, four or five blocks to the West side or the East side, whatever. Uh, but there, you know, you have to guarantee appearance number one. Um, but I do think with some adjustments to the law, there's been some already, just bring some common sense back, get rid of an, any issue that discriminates based on affluence and money, but focus on behaviors. It's not about, race, ethnicity, gender, it's about behaviors. And I think those behaviors should be paramount for a judge to make a decision on. Mm. Well, you, you know, we, we're talking about Rochester and the reputation Rochester has and whatever, and, and the crime thing. And, you know, what I've what I've been saying lately is is a lot of this crime sort of mitigating to places you wouldn't expect crime, University Avenue and whatever. And the, the gal that cuts my hair... <laughs> was actually saying the other day, she goes, you know what? I'm afraid to go downtown Rochester. And you really shouldn't be, feel afraid, but you, that, that, that is the effect of having these few things happen in areas you didn't expect them. Dom, I agree. We hear that all the time. We hear people, these perceptions, and sometimes it's social media, things are spreading around where people have a fear. And so that's where crime has a social impact. It also has an economic impact, mm-hmm. not just retail theft. I mean, 
the mere fact people come in and walk out arm loads of clothes and if a security guard stops them the guard gets fired by the company uh explain that to me i, I don't understand you know the governor announced uh, more money to retail theft getting the state police involved you know you, you, again i go back to parameters if somebody knows they can walk into a store and walk out with ten thousand dollars worth of goods no one's going to stop them um they're going to do it today tomorrow the next day and if they're addicted to drugs they're going to get a parent sick great uh, okay. get a parent sick go back uh cop some drugs and keep on doing it they don't want to go into jail where you know todd baxter our sheriff will often say in our da if somebody is given an, an appearance ticket and is not arraigned if he or she has a drug problem they don't get a chance to go to drug court get into drug treatment mm-hmm. teen court I and mean, there's all these resources our county has available that people aren't using because the system you just you kind of work around a system you get an appearance ticket and there's stories of mm-hmm. you know uh, young johnny stealing a car getting caught in pittsford getting an appearance ticket and then stealing a car to get back home again. And I just, it, it just shows you there is no sense of accountability that I, you know, I, I'll say one thing. I'll start with pets. Um, if, uh, you raise a dog and there's no rules, uh, oh, yeah. you have chaos. I'm a father. You raise children with no rules. You have chaos. If you are leading a community or living in a community with no rules, it, it just the same thing happens. I just think we have to have common sense application of laws that are fair, equitable, but focus on behaviors, especially repeat behaviors. Anyone can make a mistake, but if you make the same mistake over and over and over again, I will say mistake made more than once is not a mistake. It's a decision. Uh, so at, at this point here, somebody has to step in and say, sorry, Johnny, you've stolen three cars in the last week. Uh, no, you're not going to go home. You're going to go back to jail. Well, and it's got to affect the, the, your your recruits. I mean, who's? I mean, it, it, once you take the honor away from being a, a police officer and you go someplace and all they're doing is yelling at you and deriding you, like, and you, you're not getting paid that much money to put up with that stuff. I mean, that's gonna be, that's, that's a challenge. It, it, I'll tell you what I was telling, saying this morning. You know, I grew up in the tenth ward. Uh, we did not grow up wealthy, uh, probably a couple of notches below mid middle class. But what really started my career in my life was a civil service job. Whether you were a police officer, a teacher, you work in environmental services, anyone, these government jobs, people start off with, it really gives you a, a chance to really uh, raise a family and live a middle class lifestyle. And there's so many opportunities. And uh, a, being a police officer is a very tough job, tougher today and then probably in a decade or two decades ago, but still a great uh, opportunity for men and women to serve this community and for all the people who think it's all about guns and all so much of what officers do every day is serving people helping people uh, you know getting getting involved and, and I, I do think your officers today are better educated uh, much more connected to communities I, and a recruiter uh, recruiters that I see out there do a phenomenal job um, but there's such a lack of respect for any kind of authority today that you know uh, to me I grew up in a family you, you, didn't, you didn't hit your parents. You would never hit a teacher, hit a police officer. I mean, I couldn't imagine. Uh, I mean, I would never see the light of day in my family doing any one of those three uh, ever. I, I'd still be down in my basement locked up uh, for that. But I, I, but I think we hit, we're raising kids today where it's okay. And I just, I, yeah, I don't get that. Yeah, yeah. You, no, no, you're absolutely right. What we've done as a society is that we, we thought our children didn't have good enough self-esteem. So we, we gave them trophies for everything, I think, you know, and, you know, participation trophies and, oh, you did a great, maybe you didn't do a great job. Maybe you, you did something wrong you need to be you know you need to have consequences to it you don't anymore you know it's just oh you're being mean to the child and a certain amount of discipline you know discipline is not a bad word you know a discipline is this i mean i went to school had nuns i mean you were you are really afraid of the nuns and if the nun called your parents and said something happened blah 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 your your parents would beat the bejesus out of you discipline and, and you yeah. know honestly my parents were not hitters but they were clearly enforcers and they did a very good <laughs> job with that uh in school got hit a few times uh, there's there's no doubt but you know i played yeah. sports yeah i had coaches yelling at me oh, but yeah, i'm yeah, thinking yeah. every time i got yelled at i deserved it yeah. uh and and, and i I was never told that you know you're the greatest you know if you want something you earned it and i think one of the problems is if a child comes up goes up today thinking he is the greatest 
But in reality, he's not. Ah. When he or she goes out into the world, and all of a sudden, mommy and daddy and t- they're yeah. gone. Yeah. There's a. I think that's where some of the mental health challenges come in, where somebody realizes, hey, uh, you know, I don't, maybe I, I'm not good enough for this. And hey, listen, I played. Right. I played basketball yeah. uh, in, growing up. Yeah. And uh, I knew I was not NBA caliber. Yeah. But if I was told, oh, you're, you're starting the NBA, you're, and then all of a sudden it would not happen. And God knows what my self esteem would have done. But I was a realist. My parents were realists. They were encouraging. Um, but I go back and say, I would never change the way I was raised ever, uh, because you, whatever you got, you earned. And if you didn't earn it, you did not get it, be it allowance trophies or anything else. So my, my, my daughter's, my daughter's, uh, in school, uh, and, uh, she's on the softball team and, uh, the, the coach has the, the, has the kids all lined up and, and the coach is yelling at, at the team. And she says, the girls to the left of me are crying. The girls to the right of me are crying. He says, he wasn't really saying something all that bad. And I'm like, this is like Tuesday at my house because he goes, yep. it's not that big of a deal. He <laughs> says, if we screwed up, he's yelling at us for screwing up. He says, I kind of expect that. <laughs> I, but, but you know what? You, I, I look back at the coaches I've had and I, a person like Bobby Knight, who was yeah, known yeah, yeah, yeah. for, yeah. Being, but you know, what? I would always say, I could play for Bobby Knight because you know what? Uh, if, if you made a mistake, he was all over you. If you played well, you're good. But that to me is how you learn and grow and it shapes you in, in your life and in your career uh, as opposed to having this illusion that is something different. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, I, I'm not a crier or whatever. So people yell, they yell. I, you know, yeah. today people will break down and I mean, some of the social media stuff, I hate the bullying on social media. Uh, but I just think that we have to take a step back and maybe rethink how we're applying these principles today. No nonsense. Absolutely. And we're about ready to head into another break and we'll see you on the other side. This is Dom Genova for my friends at Valley Fuel. It was decades ago that Phil Saunders called me up and said he was starting a new company, Valley Fuel. And man, I got to tell you, this has been a great experience. If you're looking for affordable propane or home heating oil, contact Valley Fuel. If you want reliable delivery, contact Valley Fuel. If you want to do business with a local company, contact Valley Fuel. If you want to find out how to contact Valley Fuel, go to valleyfuels.com or your no-nonsense roundtable. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the No Nonsense Roundtable. We're talking to Bob Duffy, multidimensional. You're like an you're like an onion. You have different different levels of you from being a police officer. I make people cry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, you know, a police officer, police chief, mayor, uh, a lieutenant governor, and then uh, CEO and president of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce. And and so before we get too far uh, into the weeds with other things. You know, let, let's talk about another thing that's on my mind that I don't understand. I don't understand grants and what happens with grants. And, you know, we were supposed to have this big photonics thing years ago. And, you know, where did, you know, where did that go? And, and you know, and, and this life cycle thing, I, it, it sounds to me like somebody built this big thing to, you know, to recycle a manufacture and there's nothing there going into manufacture. I mean, t- explain this thing to me, will you? Real quick on a photonics. A photonics is still alive and well in Rochester. And okay. it's, it's interesting what happened when it was announced many years ago. I was not even here at that time. I was actually in Washington, I think, at a meeting. It was announced in Rochester, and there was a former elected official who was no longer with us. And I think that, fi- that person may have passed away. It did say something to the press that day that there will be like 2,000 jobs. Well, anybody knew there may have been 50 to 100. I mean, it's a packaging facility uh, for a semiconductor industry, and it's still going strong. It was funded. It's between here and Albany, but that, that is still going. But it was never seen to be a huge job creator. It's an asset. It's actually part of our, our tech hub application okay. as well. But going to Lifecycle, uh, another thing, I, I get blamed for this on social media. I was not involved in bringing Lifecycle here, but what Lifecycle is, it has this incredible technology uh, for basically uh, reusing and recycling batteries a technology that is so sought after our department of energy in dc uh got behind it wants it i'm not sure what happened uh i'm not sure if they had a cash flow issue i'm not sure there's a dispute now between them and the landlord uh we are not involved in that we're we're hoping it gets resolved whatever happens with with that dispute the one thing that has been reinforced to me on many occasions is their technology is state of the art it could really bring jobs to be an asset so 
hopefully if the current leadership uh, has an issue financially, somebody else will take over that technology and make it work. We'd love to have it make it work, make it work here in Rochester. Um, but that's what I know. I was never directly involved with that. Uh, I think the company is based in Canada, um, but uh, their technology is the real deal. Uh, this, this dispute has gone on. And again, I'm not sure if it's cash flow, other issues. Uh, you know, I, I certainly have not been apprised of the internal op, uh, workings of that, but we do hope at some point it gets resolved and this gets back on track. Well, what it sounds like to me, and, and to make a metaphor analogy out of it, is that you, you have a battery recycling business uh, back in 1908 when everybody's still in horses. Yep. I mean, yeah, yeah, you have, yeah. I mean, th- there's no automotive batteries anymore to recycle. So you have this business that may be a little bit ahead of its time, maybe 10 years ahead of its time, 15 years ahead of its time, but there's no- nothing coming in there to, to generate the cash flow that you need. That, yeah. That's that. I, it seems to me that's, that's what the deal is, but somebody gave them millions of dollars for this. And now you have a building, and the, there's a, some dispute with them and the union and how much it costs. And the, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a so Playhouse is- 90 situation, but I, I think you're right. I think the technology is very futuristic, uh, and the Department of Energy thinks, wow, this is great stuff for the future. I don't think they put their money in yet. They have some of the grant. I think they're holding back with all the stuff going on right now, but whatever is going on with leadership and management, our hope is it gets back on track. And then if this technology is what people say it is, that it'd be great to have a, a component here in Rochester, which would be a job creator. Okay, so uh, we've, we've gone through so many negative things. Let's talk about for the last you know six minutes here, some good things. What, what, what do you got going on? And now, now you're scheduled in, a, you're scheduled in a, sol- a solar eclipse. That's a big deal. The, listen, uh, the PGA Championship was our Super Bowl uh, last year, last May. I'm hearing that the eclipse will bring more people to Rochester than we're here for the PGA Championship. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge economic impact. Uh, I tell people, hey, make sure you have those glasses. Um, we're going to be right, in, we're on the path uh, for a, a, the full eclipse. It's really getting momentum. I give uh, Don Jeffries a visit Rochester and our museum team. They've been the leaders locally, done a great job promoting this. But there's an article in Democratic Chronicle about great places to see it at. And we're going to have a huge influx of people. Anyone listening who owns a restaurant that is closed on Mondays, uh, you might want to prepare because I think with this many people coming in, uh, hotels, I sense are, are wanting at least two night guarantees. We're seeing prices creep up dramatically and less hotels available. But I do think it's not going to last long, but probably a, a two day surge mm-hmm. of people coming here. Uh, they're going to want to eat, have drinks, buy some things. And I, and Rochester is great in terms of, you know, acclimating. I know there's t-shirts, hats, glasses. I mean, there's going to be opportunities to make money economically, but it's going to be exciting. And these come around less than once in a lifetime. So I think it's be a great thing that we're on that path and we'll be in total darkness for a period of time during that eclipse well a couple of weeks ago i had deb ross who is the uh, task force manager for the uh, for the solar eclipse deal here in rochester and she was saying that you have to plan now where you want to be which makes a very good point i mean do you want to be someplace where there's a, you can see out on the horizon do you want to be like in a in a situation where you're around hundreds of other people, do you want to be with just your families and friends? Because she goes, a couple of things. One, you got to plan that. Two, you got to make sure you got your glasses ahead of time because you're not going to be able to get them then. And she goes, the other thing is that after it's over, everybody wants to leave. She goes, you got 500,000 people hitting the roads wanting to leave. And she, so she's encouraging people to say, hey, you know, maybe you want to go out to dinner. Maybe you want, you know, maybe these restaurants, like yep. you're saying, that aren't open on Monday, should be open you on open. Monday. Yeah, I, make a I, big deal about it. I agree. And I, the traffic issue, state police are heavily involved right now with local authorities about trying to manage traffic. There could be some chaos with this, too. And oh, imagine, yeah. and I understand, I've never lived through one of these, but the birds and animals go crazy uh, when it goes dark during the day. But it's going to be fascinating to be part of it. And I think for us, hey, let's ride the wave, ride the eclipse, so to speak. Uh, enjoy it, uh, but but plan for it. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, don't just uh, wander in that day like you're going to be able to park somewhere and watch it. It's not going to happen. Imagine going to a Buffalo Bills game and how long it takes you to get out of the parking lot after a Bills game. You know, do that like times five, six, or seven people they're going to be watching this here and realize that you might not be able to get around as much as you'd like that day. And again, I have great faith in, in the state police and local authorities to manage traffic, but you can see people trying to stop on the expressway. If people aren't prepared, you just have to be prepared and get somewhere where you want to be. The time frames are laid out. You know, it starts at a certain time. And then when it goes totally dark for a few minutes, 
it'll be a great thing for kids and grandkids and families to at least be part of an experience. Yeah, uh, you got to remember that for the rest of your life. Now, other good things going. I, I see. You know, the mayor's got this thing. You know, this, sometimes little things are really kind of cool. He's got this tree things. We're planting trees in, yep. in Rochester. You got the the corner of uh, Clinton and Maine being renovated. That that is. I've always thought that was an eyesore. I got here in 1994. I got downtown Rochester. I go, oh my God, look at that. It's there's been projects that have failed at that corner. There's a lot going on. And uh, no, listen, I'm a realist. There certainly is negativity. We have some crime issues, other issues, but you know what? There's a lot of things going on. Uh, the governor of the state have put a lot of money in Rochester. Uh, so has Senator Schumer and the federal government. We have this uh, tech hub, Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, all together, which I think has great promise for the future. There are projects going everywhere. There are communities that have been given uh, downtown awards uh, this week. You know, I think it's, it's, it is a lot going on. And listen, accept the negative, but also acknowledge a positive. And I'll go back to the, the poll. Rochester and the Finger Lakes region. This is a great place to live. It really is. I think you have to live someplace else to realize how nice this is. I I lived outside the New York City area for well most of you know most of my uh, younger life, and then was transferred to Charlotte, North Carolina, in 1986. We came here in 1994. Actually, it was it was uh, 30 years ago that I started the dealership. Nita and I scraped up $80,000 that we had. Chrysler lent me 210000 We had six people in the little building. Uh, when we uh, sold the dealerships in 2020, we had 85 people. We sold $80 million wow. worth of stuff the year before, and it can be done. Yep. It can it can be done, and you look at the, the you look at the life that we've had here, and the things that Rochester offers you, and you need to be someplace else to realize how great this place really is. Tom, I agree. I mean, I I don't mind a cold. I'm never going to move to Florida. I might vacation here and there, but I love it up here. I do. And my one thing with the eclipse, I think the biggest frustration. My wife will say the same thing. Having a day where there's blue sky and sunlight, not exactly the everyday occurrence in upstate New York, especially <laughs> in the winter. So I'm not sure. I would say the eclipse, we kind of experienced an eclipse, a partial eclipse, most days during the winter here anyway. So we should be well prepared for it. But we're hoping for a beautiful sunny day on that day. And I just, I would ask people, uh, hey, uh, acknowledge the positive. You know, I think it takes as much energy uh, to be negative as positive. Be positive and really take a look around because there are so many great things going on right now. And I always heard my, my first first career, hear about the good old days. Well, today, today is, is a good old days because as we get down the road, we always think of how, you know, things were in the past. And I tell you what, I think Rochester is rocking and it's going to keep on rocking. Well, Bob, the 266 show, the first one and the 266 and I guess five or six in between there. So I uh, thank you for coming in. Having you on the show is always a delight. And uh, maybe we'll have to have you on like maybe twice a year. It's, it's a privilege and we've not aged a bit during those 266 <laughs> shows. So it's, well, no, it's been great. Well, you've decided to keep your hair. So you look... <laughs> <laughs> so you look younger. Next week, same time, same place. No nonsense roundtable. Thanks for listening. Tune in every weekend from 10 to 11 on News Radio Wham 1180. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll make more.